Well, it's bittersweet in many ways because this is the last lesson that I have in Gibbs composition and also the last lesson that I have with you students as well. So I was thinking about what should I teach as the final lesson and I actually gave it a title and <laughs> the title is Course Review and the subtitle is Eight Lessons in Simplicity and Grace. And I look back on the lessons that I have taught throughout the semester. And I thought really those two words, simplicity and grace, really summarize this course. I'm going to talk more about grace as I end this particular lesson. But the statement by Hans Hoffman says, the ability to simplify means to eliminate the unnecessary so that the necessary may speak. And that perhaps is the best definition I could give you on simplicity. So I also titled this, Things I Learned, and I hope there are things that you did learn along the way in Gibbs composition, even though you might have had many composition courses in the past. And perhaps you will be reminded of some of the concepts that we learned in this class as I go over the expressions and remember what has affected your writing. And because of the four months that we've had of Gibbs composition, you might see as you're going through the slides and listening to me speak, yes, now that makes sense to me. Whereas in the first time around, it might not have. So that's the essence, if you will, of the lesson for tonight. And so it's review, but there are also other concepts and ideas that I do want to present to you. When I began the course, actually it was in February of this year, I took us to Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. When you read Jeremiah, particularly chapter 15, you realize that he was in a lot of turmoil in his heart. But where he found peace and rest was going back to the word of God. And to that word of God was joy and rejoicing. And I really like the way that he pictures it. Your words are found, and I did eat them, which means the word of God became a part of Jeremiah. And as Gibbs students, I would trust and I would pray that the word is to you the joy and rejoicing of your heart. And even now this past year, as you've had an opportunity to go into the word of God, word of God grammatically and also in writing and studying the stories and also doctrines of the word of God, you can say that's even more true as a result of my time spent in the word of God. That's my prayer for you. Lesson one, I came in and I said, uh, good evening, writers. I think that was one of the first statements I made. And some of you looked at me like, wait a minute, Carol. Uh, let's not do, get too crazy here. I am not a writer. I'm taking a writing course. But I said, no, you have to see yourself as a writer. And here's an acronym. I'm a writer. I'm a wordsmith, a researcher, an interpreter, a typist, an explorer, and a reader. And all of those concepts and ideas join together, thinking that you are a writer. I also mentioned in that first lesson that writing is first creative, then corrective. And I wanted you to understand that right from the get-go, because many students come into a composition class and they see it just the opposite. And they think that writing is a process of being corrective and making sure that all of their grammatical and mechanical things are in order, and then they're going to write. And because of that, many students come in and they write in fear, they don't write well, they don't sound like themselves, and writing has just become laborious and something that you just have to do to turn it in and get on with my life. And I flipped that idea and I said, no, that doesn't come till the end of our writing process. We start first on the creative side, and that allows us to get words on the page. Helen Keller made this statement. She said, as light is to the eye, so is language to the mind. So this approach that you have as a writer is a lifelong approach that will make you even better as you continue in your writing process. Also in that first lesson, I gave you a story. And it was a story about Charlie Brown coming from the Peanuts cartoon character by Charles Schultz. And I mentioned the fact that Charlie Brown never saw himself as a good writer because he always wrote in fear. He wrote to an audience of one and he wrote to the audience of his instructor. And so when he turned in his work, it was always stilted, and it was always foreign to him, and he always came back with, you know what Grady always received, the C minus. Where on the other hand, his canine friend, Snoopy, was perched on top of his doghouse, behind his Olivetti portable typewriter, churning out one page after another as he was writing, as he saw it, the great American novel. And the answer was, the question is, what made the difference between 
Charlie Brown's approach to his writing and his friend Snoopy. Charles Schultz, the creator of Snoopy and also the, uh, Charlie Brown and the Peanuts cartoon strip, never considered himself a writer. He considered essays and book writing a higher form of art than cartoon, but he had many struggles and joys with his writing and he was a prolific reader. In fact, as I read his history, he loved reading the Word of God. And Schultz was intrigued by language. And he said, those lovely sentences and clever turnings of phrases have always made the written word so beguiling to readers of all ages. So within his cartoon strip, he did a lot of cartoons that had to do with writing and the struggles and also the joys of writing. And Schultz used Snoopy as one of the examples who understood this concept that writing well is hard work. So after Charles Schultz passed away, his son, wrote a book, and it was Snoopy's Guide to the Writing Life, because so many of the cartoon strips throughout the years had to do with the writing life. So he compiled them all, and he also had some essays write comments. But he wrote this about his father and his image of writing through Snoopy. He said, Snoopy's flights of literary imagination take hold of every writer and remind us that once we recognize and appreciate the written word and the writer's life, we are bound to chase that ever elusive perfect sentence, paragraph, story, or book. False starts and dead ends only distract us. They cannot lead us astray from our work as writers. So here are some of the cartoons that I pulled out from this book. And Snoopy was always concerned about the setting of his stories, but he always began the same way. It was a dark and stormy night. Um, Lucy said, I'm going to be your peer editor at times, and here's one of her comments, I don't know if it's terrible or awful. Uh, that's probably not the best kind of peer editor to have. <laughs> uh, we also see that Snoopy there is behind his typewriter thinking his thoughts about what he's going to write next. Uh, the next cartoon that we see, one right here, his friends are saying, there he is writing again. Nothing could deter Snoopy from writing. Here he received some of his rejection letters. He received a lot of them as he submitted his novels. Here we see him on editing day, and notice he's pulling out words and revisiting them, only just that very, and exclamation marks as well. He draws the conclusion that good writing is hard work. We can all see. We understand <laughs> he's, where he's coming from, right? <laughs> we also know that good writing is aware of its audience. The novice writer doesn't get this. The novice writer writes just for himself or herself and doesn't realize that there's a whole realm of people out there interested in reading the work that the writer is producing. So we always ask ourselves the question when we begin writing for the public, who is our target audience? And this is a key that separates good writing from bad. It motivates you when you sit down, when you realize and you envision somebody else on the other side is going to read my work. And that also inspires us. So we write to real people in order to do something to someone. Writers who write for the wrong reasons think of writing as a mechanical act with certain good surface features. And when they write, they try to make their article or their essay that includes them. We know that's part of it, but that's not where we begin. So when you sit down to write, Right at the beginning, you need an imaginary reader in your head. And as you write every line, you imagine a first time reader reading it and guess how he or she is going to respond or react to what you're writing. And the more you hear the reader's responses, the better you can decide how to react and how to control him or her with your words. Guess what? The better you're going to write. And different readers react differently. Remind yourself you can't make everybody happy, so that's why you remind yourself as well, who is my target audience? You can't write for the world. Good writing gives readers everything they need to read you well. And when you are writing, you feel the presence of the audience, just like a stage actor does when he or she's on the stage. The only difference is your audience is imagined. As writers, we also understand this. 
We like to use bold print sometimes on some of our words, or sometimes we'll use italics, sometimes we'll use dashes or colons or even ellipsis dots because this is all part of the readability of our text and we're thinking about our reader when we're adding these. So a simple way for you to write well is to write something you would love to read out loud. So we're getting the writer's attitude. And the big stuff of writing goes on before you even put words on the paper. That's why I intentionally tried to give you as much time as I could in between the major paper assignments. In fact, I think it was one month in between each one that was due. So you could have time to think, jot down notes, research if necessary, and then you're mentally ready to put words in some kind of order. Until students write for the reason successful writers write, they won't write well. And I put number three, don't write for the wrong reasons. And would you please pair it back to me? What are the wrong reasons that many people write? And I'll give you the first one, and then you can follow me. Writing is an exercise to express yourself. Mm, wrong reason. What are some other wrong reasons? Yes, Becca. Oh, I'm sorry, can we take the microphone? And <laughs> it's just that our friends like to hear what we say. To write primarily for a grade. To write primarily for a grade. Other re reasons, wrong reasons. To write for the teacher. Yeah, to impress a teacher. To follow the rules. To demonstrate extensive vocabulary. Mike's great outlining skills to avoid grammar mistakes, to hide my ignorance. Those are all the wrong reasons. So how do I write well right now? Here were the four recommendations that I gave you. Imitation, motivation, feedback, and practice. Don't forget these four. Imitation is the top of the list. By imitation, I use that term, uh, studying for the craft. You're now a writer, and you must study other writing with that perspective. Students, make it a habit of reading of what is being written today and what has been written by earlier masters. We, as Christian writers, are surrounded by good models. And that's why every session that I came in here, I would give you a list of good models for you to read. And that's the benefit that we have as writers, because writing is learned by imitation, as is true with speaking. You think about how children learn language. They learn it from those around them. They imitate what they hear. The same is true with writing. If anybody asked me how I learned to write, I'd say that I learned by reading the men and women who were doing the kind of writing I wanted to do to figure out how they did it because we all need models of the craft or art we're learning. We eventually move past our models, but this is the way we start, and so we surround ourselves with excellent models. We make language the way we see it. We have no other, no other choice, so expose yourself continually to models that are written the way you want to write. Don't stop reading for the craft or studying for the craft once this course is over. Keep doing that and looking at it through the lens of a writer. How well, you might say, how do I read like a writer? You expose yourself to how the writer affects you. You look at how the writer introduces his or her article. You look at how the writer transitions into the body of the text and how that one sentence is connected to the next sentence. You look at how the writer closes, you look at how the writer titles, you listen to the tone of the writer, that emotional mood that's coming off the piece. You look at their word choice as well. You look at how they're writing to the audience. You're looking at the tense, the time of the piece. You're looking at the tone, and also you're looking at the point of view. So all these things are coming into you as you are reading and studying for the craft. And it's so strange how this works, but it does. It just is, like I've said, it's like osmosis, and you take on that flavor, if you will, of that kind of writing, and you do become your own writer, but it affects your writing as well. So if you're writing character sketches, 
if you're writing biographies, if you're writing an autobiography, read those at that time. If you're writing expository essays or articles, read a boatload of expository articles or essays that you like. And so you read for the craft to experience the effect of the art and to see how the effect is wrought. So first thing, how do I write well? By imitation or by studying for the craft. Number two, it's motivation. It's interesting because to write well, you have to want to. I'm going to say that again. To write well, you have to want to. And that's why, as Snoopy says, writing is hard work because you have to want to write well. If you can't find real personal reasons to write, you won't write well, period. Yet in our world, unfortunately, we usually accept hating to write as par for the course, and we try to work our way around it. So here's my recommendation. Write something you want to write. Say something that matters to you. Write to people you want to talk to. And write something you'd love to read. And with that in mind and that formula, you won't be able to stop yourself putting words on paper. And here's another motivation, even better than what I just said. Let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Interesting promise the Apostle Paul has for us in Galatians 6, 9. In due season we shall reap if we faint not. To everything there is a season, and a time for every purpose under heaven. Such is true in nature, and dear students, such is true in our lives. Quite often the seed that is planted in the ground does not bear immediate fruit. It takes time to take root and to bear that fruit. And such is true in our lives, such is even true in our writing. You may not see right now how the Lord is going to use your Gibbs studies or Gibbs grammar or Gibbs composition, but you must trust him with it. So... My recommendation is don't grow weary in well-doing because that is the greatest, greatest hazard in the Christian life. So imitation, motivation. The third thing that helps me to write well is peer feedback or peer review. Now feedback helps when it is offered as suggestions given to accomplish what the writer wants to do. And poor Snoopy. His peer editor, his peer reviewer is Lucy, and certainly she has her own ideas about writing. But one of the most difficult decisions a writer makes is when to take advice and when to ignore all those well-meaning peer reviewers and do it your own way. But I want you to keep this in mind. Almost every work that we write can bear improvement. And when you're first starting out, it's hard to know how much is enough and how much is too much advice, where you've engaged your reader and where you've not, and where you've bored him or her to tears. And also the temptation is to submit the article, what you're writing to everyone. And I'm going to caution you in this. Submit your work to peer reviewers whom you can trust, whom you know have walked a path similar to yours that they've been in writing classes. And you were surrounded by those as well. You have Gibbs colleagues who graduated before you, taking you all the way back to that 1992 cohort. So they can help serve as peer editors. You have Pastor Roxer and Pastor Stegel who can serve as peer editors and published authors. I will continue to serve as a peer editor if you so choose. Once you're my student, you're always my student, my heart and on my prayer list. And so you can always come back to me and say, I'm thinking of submitting an article, I'm writing this for, or I'm looking at this message, would you mind if, I look, if you review it? But it's your job as a writer to make these judgments yourself. And you write long enough, and you'll know the good sentences from the clunkers. Are you starting to see that in your own writing now? Because that is so true. I was writing just a couple of days ago, and I thought, oh, that's a clunker. <laughs> you just start to recognize that in your own work. So you read your dialogue aloud, 
and soon you'll be able to distinguish the lines that are real from those that don't sound real. They sound phony. They don't sound like you. They sound stilted. Here's another comment. Writing is self-taught. Remember I said that in one of my first lessons? I can't teach you how to write, you're going to teach yourself. And how do you teach yourself? Well, you come to a composition class and you get a lot of good advice and ideas from the writing instructor, but then in turn you write, and the writing instructor gives you feedback. You look back at some of the comments and you rework and you rewrite, and it comes back to you, rework and rewrite, and that is how you learn how to write well. And that's how I can make that statement. Writing is self-taught. Uh, most of us have learned to write well by writing badly for so long that it takes us time to relearn, if you will, how to write well, but also to relearn the joy of writing. Children love to write. You can't stop them from writing. Like I said in one of my lessons, they'll even write on the wall sometimes. But what happens along the way when they lose their joy of writing? How unfortunate. So I hope if that was your case, you regained that joy and you are motivated to write well. All right, so we have imitation, we have motivation, we have peer feedback, and you know what the last piece is to help you to write well? Practice. Practice. The more you write, the better. And as a Gibbs student, and in your present and your future ministries, writing should be treated as an ever-present, integral part of your thinking, reading, and conversing. And you might say to yourself, Mrs. Helen, I will never ever have a published article. That is not what I'm thinking I'm going to be doing. You don't know. You don't know where the Lord is going to take your writing. Plus, I am sure you're going to, in some ways, teach some class somewhere or some group of students or some, in some camp or retreat, and that is part of the writing as well, because you're writing for that audience. So you learn to write by writing. You can't get around it. The only way to learn to write is to force yourself to produce a certain number of words on a regular basis. I have a question for you. Do you ever get writer's block? All the time. There are many kinds of writer's block, as there are kinds of writers, interestingly enough. We all might have our own form of writer's block. Um, but I have some suggestions for you as writers regarding writer's block, and writer's block means I'm just, I, I, I'm frozen. I, I, I don't know where to go with this. I have no fresh ideas. So here are some I ideas I have for you that might help you in this area. Give yourself time. And again, that's why I tried to give you at least a month between major paper assignments. Give yourself time. No rule of writing is broken more often than that one. Waiting until the last minute before a paper is due or believing that we write better under pressure simply is not true. So time pressure heightens fear, and we never do well when we're operating in that fear mode. Don't force out a draft the night before. That will definitely cause writer's block. And at times we are tempted to say, and I'm including myself in the we, I have an impossible schedule. I have a job. I am so busy. And let's face it, no one is going to give you free time to write. But you must see it as a priority and you discipline yourself to give yourself time to write. You have a job, you have a family perhaps, you have ministry responsibilities and many other projects and intrusions of life. But that's just the way life is. When I was a young mother of three children, I said to Mrs. Donna Racky, after a particularly hectic Christmas season, when we were co-directing the Christmas program together, I made this statement to her, I wonder when things are going to slow down. And she turns to me and says in a very loving and caring manner, Carol, haven't you learned? Things will not slow down until we are with the Lord. That is just the way life is when you're involved in the work of the ministry. And I have never forgotten 
that helpful piece of advice. God knows your schedule. God knows your responsibilities. And he will show you how to fulfill your responsibilities and how to find those extra minutes and hours for writing and for ministry. And I don't want you to think of interruptions as distractions because they're actually teaching moments for you. Limit them if you can, but realize that you are always learning and that an interruption may be a learning process in and of itself. Don't dismiss it. So a telephone call, someone ringing your doorbell, uh, extra playing time with the children can all kick your thinking into a new and creative direction without even being aware that it is happening. The Lord uses all things in our lives to serve him for his honor and glory. So I want you to discover how not only to redeem time, but to glean time as well. Um, and I also don't want you to forget to call yourself a writer. That will help when you have those writer's blocks. And don't just write talk your writing. That also helps through writer's block. And imagine yourself talking and write down what you hear. Another thing that will help you with writer's block is write to your favorite audience. Write to your favorite audience. Think of that audience out there when you're working. People get tense when they talk to strangers. Write to someone to whom you can freely talk. And remember the audience and make the audience small made up of people with the similar interests as you perhaps, or values and education, and take your ego out of consideration. We get stage fright if we feel our ego is on the line. So sometimes we think the article or the essay is all about us, but the audience doesn't think that way. They think you're just merely the messenger. So that, those are my suggestions to help you overcome writer's block, which we all experience from time to time. Remember that writing has four pillars, style, readability, structure, and grammar. Of these four, which is the most important? The t one that I spent the most time on, which is the style side of it. That is what you bring in, your voice and your own unique style to the writing process. Also making sure that it's readable, that your audience wants to continue reading your work. Then when we moved into the more structured formats of expository writing, we found more structure and then at the end, we worked on our grammar and our mechanics. But they all work together when we turn in a published piece. We also learned in this course that there are basically four types of writing. We started actually with a narrative, and that was the story. And you wrote your personal testimony. Then we moved into the descriptive essay, which was the character sketch, which really did still fall under the personal narrative genre. And then we moved into the expository essay. Some of you moved into the persuasive side of it. You decided you were gonna do an argument on the expository side. But expository means to inform or to instruct. And so we learned all these different formats in the four months we were here at Gibbs Composition. Then we moved into lesson two. And lesson two had to do with the personal narrative and what's your story. And it was interesting when you shared with me that some of you struggled with that. Was that the most difficult of the three assignments? I'd like to get your feedback on that. Some say no, some say yes. Just overall, give me a, your, a general thought. The testimony. Was that the, one of the more easiest of the types of writing? Okay, I'm seeing yes. And here might be the reason why some are nodding yes. Writers are at their most natural when they write in the first person. Writing is an intimate transaction between two people conducted on paper, and it will go well to the extent that it re retains its humanity. Therefore, I encourage you writers often to write in the first person. Use I, use me, use we, use us. You may have learned differently in some of your composition classes, thinking that using the I first person point of view is undignified. So getting writers to use I is seldom easy. And sometimes my writers resort to using the generic pronoun one, as in one finds himself in a difficult situation. And I ask the question, who is the elusive one? <laughs> I don't know, I've never met him actually or her. <laughs> Of course, I sometimes typically isn't used in newspapers or term papers or thesis or dissertations, but still, when I isn't permitted, here's my recommendation, it's still possible to be visible just behind your words. Don't lose that in your writing. So what is your story? 
I think this is our story, all of us. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. You all had different testimonies and stories, but it all led to the same place. It led us to the foot of the cross and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and was buried and rose again. And that was our story, though we had different ways of getting there. And we praise our Savior all the day long for his great grace and love for us. It's been said that the best writers are the ones who really, in their hearts, aspire to the byline anonymous. The story told is important, not the storyteller. And that's, I think, so true for us as Christian writers. Because ultimately, who do we want to glorify? Our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the story of his love and grace in whatever format or genre we're writing in. So our name might be on the article, but it's not all about us. It's all about him, and then in turn, it's all about the audience who receives the message that we write. Well, you've heard me say this time and time and time again, and I hope you don't forget it. In your writing, I don't care what type of writing, show, don't tell. Avoid generalized abstractions and replace those with concretions. Wordiness and pretentiousness are things we take out of our writing, and vitality is what we put in. You can construct vitality by adding to your work these vitalizing techniques that I've listed here. Setting. It was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> In the old days of the former masters of writing, they wrote a lot of description. And sometimes when we were reading them as English majors, we would sometimes skip that. Let's get to the story. Uh, they were devoted to setting and sometimes even weather, but not so much today, especially the the English writers were like that. You can have a good story without setting if the characters and narrative are strong and they can hold our interest. But all events occur somewhere and often the place where they occur has a profound influence over what occurs. So a story's setting puts us there and when you read Bible stories, you will typically find the setting is included in the story. Think of the example that we studied in our course. Remember the story of the birthright? And we were heavily involved in setting there. Uh, with Bible stories, the setting is simultaneously physical, it's temporal, and it's cultural. And it's important, I think, for us to remember that as well when we're writing our stories. Characters. Hmm. Humanize your writing. You can hardly have too many people in your writing. We like to read about people. So populate your writing with signs of human life and give them names. We like names as well attached to the people. And people are what make writing matter. You can hardly have too many of them. So the important thing is to make sure you include characters in your writing. And then let people talk. It's interesting because dialogue can move a story along far better than a loads of description. And haven't you noticed that when you're reading stories, you always kind of move into that dialogue section because that moves the story along quite well. Thinking of the plot, thinking of the tense or the time of your story. What was your story written in? What time was it in? Was it in past tense? Was it in present tense? Was it in future tense? Most people write in the past tense, interestingly enough. Like I went to Virginia yesterday. But some people write agreeably in the present tense. I'm sitting at a Chinese restaurant in Virginia. But what is recommended is don't go back and forth between your tenses. If you start in your past tense, pretty much stay there. If you start in the present tense, stay there. Don't move me around because then I won't know what time you're in and I get lost in your story. Point of view has to do with first, second, or third person. So I'm going to ask you a question. In the personal narrative, you wrote primarily in the first person. Your character sketch, what was the person in? What, second? Uh, you did the you? Third. Primarily third, because you were writing about someone else. He, she, it, they, them. When you wrote your expository essay, and you have a choice on this one because it depends on your organizational mode, what was your person? Just throw it out to me. You got first and second, so I'm thinking you wrote process analysis somewhere along the line, or maybe you wrote um, what other persons were on. First person? 
the first. Um, so if you're in the first, I'm thinking, and we'll get to this in a little bit, you're in process analysis type of writing. Um, but in process analysis, too, you use you a lot. How many of you were in the second person in your I and you? Okay. So process analysis might tell, this is my story, but also I'm talking to you, the audience. So we have to keep really focused on what's our point of view. Could you please uh, share with me what are the crossing points and what is takeaway? And a story, it's really important, you know, actually in all forms of essays, it's important to have crossing points and takeaway. What, is that, what does that mean? What do crossing points mean? Um, crossing points are where the reader finds themselves things that they identify with in your writing. Couldn't have said it better, Mark. It's called reader identification. Your readers see themselves on what you wrote. And how would you identify uh, takeaway? Anybody? I, I have unless Mark wants to answer that. <laughs> it seems really self-explanatory, but it's when you've finished reading what's left in your mind. Yeah, and, it, it, and you're right, it does seem self-explanatory, but quite often we don't think about it. Takeaway is, what do I want the reader to take away from what I wrote? And quite often it's that very last paragraph or that last sentence that allows me then to have that take away whatever that idea is. So we don't want to forget any of these important vitalizing techniques when we're writing. Lesson three, we talked about writing with style. I want to read this cartoon to you in case you can't see it from where you are. It says, to make a long story short, what it all boils down to in the first analysis is that what you should take away from this is, haven't we all been to meetings like that? But unfortunately, that type of language can seep into our writing as well. That's not style. That's called wordiness. But we want style in our writing. And style means exactly what it means in the rest of your life. It's the how instead of the what. Your way of doing things, your manner, your way of expressing yourself. And by the end of Gibbs' composition, I know your style. And each one of you is unique in your style. Each one of you has a unique voice. So I don't even have to look at the name on the paper. I can read it, and I say, this is Bailey's writing. This is Barry's or this is Gus's, or such. Because I can see the style that you're presenting, which is wonderful, because we all have our own unique style. Readers read with their eyes, but they also, in fact, hear what they are reading far more than you realize. And catch yourself as a reader on that one. Therefore, such matters as rhythm of your writing and alliteration are vital to every sentence. If your sentences move along at the same plodding gait, which you might even realize until you read it out loud, you know, I have to make some changes here. This is not good style. So read everything that you write aloud before you let it out to the world. Because in that way, you begin to hear where the problem lies. Words are the only tools that you have, so learn to use them with originality and care. And remember, somebody out there is listening when they're reading your work. So here are some elements to consider. Here she goes again with those lively verbs, the sentence and paragraph length, the concretions versus the abstractions, the similes, the metaphors, the cliches, exemplifications, particulars, and wordiness. You know what I've said. Use active verbs unless there's no comfortable way to get around using a passive verb. And the difference between an active verb and a passive verb is a difference between life and death in your writing. Verbs are the most important tools in your communication toolbox. They push your sentences forward and they give it momentum. If you want to go back and revisit how active verbs give vitality to the written word, pick up the King James Bible and notice all the active verbs. That is why it is the most beautifully written book that has ever been written and published. Use lively verbs. 
Active voice is subject, verb, and result, and passive reverses that order. Also consider your sentence length and your paragraph length. My recommendation is shorter is better than longer, but you don't want all your sentences short, obviously. You don't want all your paragraphs short. But if in the long scheme of things, it is difficult for a reader to look at a lot, big chunk of a paragraph. And he or she almost takes a deep breath. Here we go. That is true for us when we're reading textbooks, but that's true for us when we're reading other material as well. For some reason, our mind likes shorter chunks of material to process that information, to move on to the next. The same is true for our sentences. Um, we like concretions, things that we can see, feel, weigh, measure, get a hold of with our senses. Um, similes and metaphors work so well for us in adding vitalizing techniques and adding concretions. And we learn that the Word of God is filled with similes and metaphors. Just look at James, the book of illustrations, and other books as well. And you'll notice how often abstract ideas are made concrete through similes and metaphors. William Zinzer, who wrote On Writing Well, and I've quoted from him often, said, clutter is the disease of American writing. We are a society strangling in unnecessary words, circular constructions, pompous frills, and meaningless jargon. Oh, that clutter just gets into our writing and that wordiness, it's fillers in our writing. And you probably noticed, I try to carefully do this with my pencil, but when I saw clutter or wordiness in your work, I would carefully take that pencil and say you could get rid of all those words and the clarity comes through. But we tend to add a lot of fillers and wordiness is when it takes too long to say it say. And you have to do this as a writer. You have to stir up a great loathing for wordiness in your writing. And then try to re-say leanly whatever you've written that feels like it takes you too long. Watch out for the of preposition used often. Watch out for the is, are constructions, the there is, there are. And all phrases that begin your sentences that end with that. When you started your sentence in that way, and I wrote it, started an email this afternoon, and I said, there you go, Carol, there's that wordiness. You're starting that sentence and ending in that, and it creates wordiness. Delete it and start it again. Put your subject first, get your active verb in there, and move on with your sentence. We talked about biography in the Bible. We said it has a big part to play in the Word of God, so we want to learn to study it well. Um, God has given us the form of biography so that we can learn valuable spiritual lessons from the failures and successes of real men and women. And we know the Bible portrays characters exactly as they are. Here's a book that's named for a character, Job. We read his story throughout that book. But how many other books of the Bible are named for characters? Can you name some of them for me? Think about it. We have Ruth, Esther, Esther. Esther, Nehemiah. All the major and minor prophets, their name is on the book. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. What else? James, Peter, Philemon, Jude. My goodness, we have a lot of books that bear the name. And that's why it's important that we study. Also know how to study the characters within the word of God. So I gave you my recommendations when you're doing a character sketch. And you will. This isn't the end of it. If you're in the work of the ministry, you're going to be telling stories and you're going to be zeroing in on characters and this is the best way to communicate this. Remind yourself that if somebody is reading a character sketch, quite often they're reading it with the Bible in hand and they're reading along in some of the portions that you're quoting. But also don't forget to research your character before you start writing. The research on the character is vital and I gave you a format that you could follow. I hope that proved helpful for you. You begin with those concretions and then you turn them into scenes and showing without telling, and you create that dominant impression. So whether you're writing about a character or you know that you're going to give a lesson on a character, this is a great format for you to follow. I talked about the character sketch title, and I gave you several ideas. And as I did my research on many character sketches that I read, 
typically most of them have the name of the character and then they have the dominant impression that follows. So they either push the dominant impression forward with a dash or they put the dominant impression with a colon. So here I have two different authors. One is J. Oswald Sanders who wrote the book People Just Like Us. He liked the dash. Noah, a man or a myth, question title. Sarah, the woman who laughed. Job, a graduate degree in suffering. Barnabas, mistaken for a god. See, there you have the name of the character and then the dominant impression that the reader wants you to remember. Then J. Vernon McGee wrote more real characters and he used the colon title. Amos, the country preacher who came to town. Jonah, dead or alive. Zacchaeus, fruit of the sycamore tree. Simon Peter, fisherman, fisherman of fire. Beginning, ending, and titling. When a reader picks up your essay or article, you're not going to be there to say, I just keep reading. It really gets better later on. I've got a terrific paragraph coming. Just, just wait. There's no later on for your reader. If the reader is not intrigued right off the bat, he or she does not necessarily have to be shocked or startled or amazed, but they must be tantalized enough to want to read on. And I've made a statement that an essay is only as good as its first four to five sentences. So a well-crafted opening tells the reader exactly what he is dealing with regarding the writer. So here's some time-tested openers that I gave as suggestions, which is the hook, the question, telling a story, or having a thesis statement if you have an expository essay. Because the hook gets the reader's attention right from the get-go. You can use a quotation, define a term, present an interesting observation. You think of the way you're going to hook that reader. And as difficult as um, a hook may be, the question also is, well, how long should I have it? Should it be one paragraph in length? Should it be two or longer? In the examples that I gave you, most of the openers were about two paragraphs in length, I noticed. Some went into three. Um, make your opener full-bodied, but if you think a one-paragraph opener is going to work, then go for it. You make the decision as the writer. And writing an opener is difficult, but closing can be even more difficult. Readers want to know when it's going to end and how you're going to get them there, and they don't want you to write the terms in summary, in conclusion. The last point is they know all this. They can tell it's in the conclusion. They want you to end well. So the last sentence is so important. And failure to know where that sentence should occur can wreck an article. So spend time thinking about your close. Spend time thinking about that final sentence where it gives the reader a lift and it lingers in the reader's mind. And when you're ready to stop, writers, stop. If you presented all the facts and all the information and the point you wanted to make, look for the nearest exit. And often it takes just a few sentences to wrap things up. And for a story, I personally really like the full circle conclusion because it goes back to that opening note that we heard at the beginning and it brings us back and reminds us of what, how the story started. We talked about expository essay titles. I'm, I'm really going to be curious to hear about your titles on this one. But there are different formats you can use, and I pulled these actually from the Grace Family Journal. You can have a question title in your expository essay. How do you grow spiritually? Pastor Roxer wrote that article. You can declare the topic, Tom Stiegel, the meaning of the gospel. You can give a why title. Why should we pray? My Harry Ironside. The declarative sentence title, which I found in a personal narrative by Sarah Witzig, an empty Unitarian finds rest in Christ. Or you can even have a colon title and expository essay. The Bible, a victorious book by William Evans. So you have quite a few choices, but I want you to remember, take your titles seriously. Here's a piece of advice from a writer. One writer told me, I always write my title before I write anything else. The question was, why? The answer, because it keeps me focused 
That's exactly what I'm writing about. So sometimes if I drift, I go back and I see, oh, that's the title. Now, I might change it along the way, but I have my title in mind. I had another writer tell me, the title's the last thing that I write. I look to see what I've written, and then I find my title sometimes right within my essay, right within my article, and I pull that out, and I put it as my title. Take your title seriously. It's your first introduction to your essay or also to your message, for that matter. The essence of writing is rewriting. Here's a statement for you. Might want to write this one down. Articles or stories aren't written. They're rewritten. Rewriting is the essence of writing well. It's where the game is won or lost, says William Zinzer. I'm going to ask this question, and I, our friends offside can text this too. Has this been a process for you in your writing experience of rewriting? Or in the past, have you written, turned it in, received your comments in the grade, and off you go? What has been the experience? How many of you have been rewriters? Maybe on your own or in, in a course? Um, in the past, I've never been a rewriter. Usually, I haven't even looked at what the comments are. I just looked at the grade, and that was it. I appreciate your honesty. One and done. That's how I did every paper. You did. Mm -hmm. Very good. I was the same as those two. Yeah. <laughs> Me too, in college. Is that right? Not one. Isn't that interesting? Any students who were in my composition class in the past always knew that the portfolio was coming, and that meant they were rewriting and rewriting. But here was the idea. They took ownership of it, and they said, I want to rewrite for excellence, and knowing that when it goes into the portfolio, it's becoming a published piece. And it was interesting for the stories that my students would share. Some of them actually took it out and published some of their work. And others said, you know, I'm putting this up in the attic, and someday my children or my grandchildren will open up that portfolio and they'll be able to read some of my work. So when you look at it from the perspective of that, it's more than just the teacher, get the grade and off we go. It's this is who I am and this is a part of me, an experience or a perspective that I want to share with others. So when I keep saying to you, the essence of writing is rewriting, I hope that you understand that now, and I hope even the process of the portfolio help. Um, quite often, essays go through several iterations, and you went through a couple, but if you think this is going to be a published piece, then you can bring it back to me on your third or fourth rewrite, and I certainly can give you uh, my perspective. Does this look familiar to you? Look up here, please. Does this look familiar to you? You might say, yes, it does, Mrs. Helen. That looks like what my paper looks like when I receive it back from you. I took a page here from, uh, from somebody who had some editing, and this is typical. This is a professional writer who went through an editor and some of the work that came out. So I didn't want you to be offended by the work that I did as your editor. I'm here as your friend. I'm here as your instructor, and I'm here to help you to write well. So this is what I was doing when I was working with your work. I was pruning, I was shaping, I was clarifying, I was tidying inconsistencies of tense and pronouns and location and tone. I was noticing all the sentences that could be um, rid of clutter. I divided lo awkward long sentences into shorter ones. I put you sometimes back on the main road if you strayed on a side path. And I tried to build bridges where you lost the reader by not paying attention to the transitions. As an editor, I can see things objectively in your work. We quite often can't. We just can't. And sometimes when I get work back from my writing instructors, I'm so thankful I had some excellent ones, I thought, yeah, I, how did I miss that? Of course that is true, that I could write this clearly, or I didn't have good transitions there, or I, I didn't clarify my thesis statement. So that is what is so helpful when you have an editor who is your friend and colleague and um, helps you in that process. So we learned in ex expository writing, um, that was one of our last lessons, it actually was lesson six, that there are different types of expository writing, and expository writing is informative. Maybe your essay explained 
a process described, defined, instructed, or informed. I'm going to find out in a minute where you are in this because you had patterns of organization that you could select. And I call a pattern of organization the grand design. So when you're thinking about a more formal article like the expository essay, and I know for Pastor Roxer, you're going to be writing expository messages. You think in terms of what is my design? Am I going to have a cause effect design? Am I going to have a comparison contrast? Is mine going to be process analysis? Is it going to be argumentative? What is my design that I'm going to set up for this essay? Because here are the various ones that are at our disposal that we can use. Um, the reader should not be thinking, oh, this is a process analysis, this is a cause effect, unless, of course, it's a writer like yourself. But most don't look at the design, but it keeps the writer or the reader focused, and it has logical ways to organize a text. When you are writing a formal expository essay, I want these four words to ring in your thinking. Thesis, audience, purpose, tone. Thesis, audience, purpose, tone. That drives your writing, whether you're giving, going to give a message or you're giving the written word. You think, what is going to be my thesis? Who is my audience? What tone am I going to use? And what is my purpose? Can you uh, share with me your thoughts about tone? And is this something new to you as well, having tone in your writing? Was this a new concept? Tone is the emotional mood that comes from your piece. Your tone can be very casual and conversational. And there are writers who really lean toward that tone, and we've seen Warren Wiersbe as one of those. A tone can be very formal, can be almost very professorial and very academic, and that's fine in the particular situation that it's in. But the point is to have a tone. Again, is this a new concept for you, that tone needs to emanate from your work? Must be. <laughs> it's not really new uh, for me, just in the sense that I do a lot of professional writing or business writing, and so you're seeking to have a, a real academic or professional tone a lot of times when you're writing to other professional people. And then because I deal with individual clients, I, I definitively shift my tone when I'm writing to my clients, and it's more conversational than it is when I'm writing more of a business mm -hmm. letter. So mm -hmm. in, in terms of this type of writing, though, I think it was unique to be thinking about tone a little bit more. And I know in this last paper, or last essay, it was struggling to, to maintain a consistent tone in terms of does this have a teaching type of a tone to it, or does it have a storytelling narrative type of a tone to it? Am I trying to explain something and teach something, or am I trying to relate, share a shared relatable um, story type of a thing? I appreciate your saying that because readers pick up on your tone, and that's why it's very important that we're cognizant of it, that we maintain the same tone throughout. So purpose really affects our tone when you think about it. And also the audience affects our tone as well. So this is an important thing for us to consider as writers because tone establishes the writer's voice. But please have a tone. And tone is determined by purpose. And the more tones that you have at your disposal, the better a writer you will be. So don't always write everything in the same tone. So I like to revisit our conversation of two weeks ago regarding the expository essay, and at the time we were still in the planning mode and the brainstorming mode, and I just asked you to share with me where you were at with the expository essay, and I'm sure now you've done some thinking, you've done some writing, of course the final draft, or the first draft will be coming to me. My question to you is, and i like also the um, student, the off-site students to share this, what is your title of your expository essay? Did you come up with a thesis? Not that you needed a formal one, but at least you had to have a thesis in mind. Who is your audience? What is your purpose? What is your tone? And what organizational design or strategy did you use to set up the essay? So last time I started with Barry, I won't do that this time to you, Barry, but um, do you mind since I'm 
I guess by you, Gus, that you start there, and I'd also like the offset site students to text in this information. So thinking about the expository essay, Gus, what is your title? Uh, the title is Slave to Sin or Prince of Heaven with a question mark oh. uh, after it. And then in terms of the thesis, the idea, um, I'll just look at it because I, I should know this, I guess. But <laughs> So I, I presented the two options by explaining them and defining what I meant by slave to sin and what I meant by prince of heaven. And then I moved on to a section where um, I discussed why it's, um, it's hard to live as a prince of heaven. So it's, an obvious, it's obviously preferable to being a slave to sin, but why then wouldn't it just be automatic or why wouldn't it come easily? And then th the third section of the, of the essay focused on how can you achieve victory over the, or how can you solve that dilemma, mm -hmm. so to speak? And so it had a very instructive tone to it, if we're getting to tone. Purpose was to try to, um, so the audience was believers struggling with this dilemma between knowing that they're in Christ and knowing that they're a child of God and, and maybe now because of the paper seeing that as even a royal uh, title, a royal status. They see that, but they're struggling to, to take hold of it or to uh, live in light of that reality. So the purpose was try to teach, uh, encourage, um, try to even present some ways of thinking that might be helpful. Um, and so the tone was was teach more of a teaching instructive tone. Organizational design was what I laid out here. Here's the here's the possibilities. Here's why it's a problem and why everyone probably who's a believer relates to this, but here's a bunch of principles that might guide you to victory in this struggle. Thank you, Gus. Were you in, what point of view were you using? Were you in the uh, first and second, primarily second? Primarily second, uh, but I tried to be vulnerable too and share mm -hmm. some little bits. I, I did write in my I comments that, 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 that I felt that I I felt that I fell short of not being as vulnerable as I try normally to be when I'm teaching verbally. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the letter about you know, reflections on this, one of my main reflections was that I don't feel that this yet is as vulnerable as it should be mm -hmm. in terms of commiserating with the dilemma that the Apostle Paul is experiencing in the seventh of Romans and every believer has experienced and will continue to experience. Mm -hmm. So there was more you, mm -hmm. um, but there was actually a fair amount of we. So I, I feel like I gets included with you to become we. Sure. And so there's a fair amount of we uh, in there too. So I think that's, a, that's probably a place where when you look at it, there, there's gonna be some tightening up that can sure. be done in, in that sense. Uh, thank you for sharing that, and I will be doing that with these expository essays. Remember, this is a first draft, so I'll go through and make my comments and revisions and such, get it back to you, and then you can decide where it goes from there. If you think I might send it back to you, uh, Carol, you certainly can. Becca? Um, first, I'll read Cassie's, because sure. I have this here. Um, Cassie's essay is titled, Serving at the Siemens Mission, How to Initiate a Gospel Conversation. Her audience is future or current volunteers at the, at the mission, and the essay is a process analysis with four subtopics. Be prepared, be compassionate, be aware, and be an eagle. And that's what I have from her on that. Yeah, that's helpful. Interesting she's using the subtopics. Yeah. And she keeps them in the same pattern and rhythm. Um, and then my paper, the title, I, I changed. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I had battled through um, <laughs> multiple ideas and something that was reasonable that I was passionate about and I could kind of bite off uh -huh. in this amount of time. So um, what came to me, my title is A Ministry to Evangelize, Why You Should Care. And um, I can read my thesis here. It is, this is what I came up with, it is God's will that believers evangelize the lost, motivated by their own salvation, knowing that he provides everything needed to do it. 
and it was a process analysis paper, mm -hmm. and my audience was um, believers that might have grown up in church and have just always been saved, and so mm -hmm. they don't have something to compare to almost, of like the fear of death or hell and feeling mm -hmm. either inadequate, not really motivated, don't care, or just apathetic to share the gospel with people. And so it was a little challenging because it, I think I switched tones at times too. It was personal in my life, but then also going to God's word and instructing. So mm -hmm. I don't know. That's okay. You can switch it going from yeah, I to you. Just, that's fine. And if you recall, that's what um, Ian Roxer did in his Pray Without Ceasing. He's mm -hmm. going between the I and the you, telling his own story, then sharing it with the audience. Sure. I don't know. When I, you know, when you write it, it's not always as, I can't see it as clearly as somebody from the outside. So it's, it's probably more random and my thinking, but um, what else? Yeah, so my tone was encouraging, hopefully instructive from God's word, mm -hmm. and maybe just I can relate. Have There's somebody who relate too. conversational. Mm -hmm. I can I can relate, and this is what I found to encourage me, or what God's word has to say about the topic. I look forward and to a call that. and a call too. Yeah. Oh, that sounds very interesting. I'll do. I just love reading your work. Thank you. All right, my title is The Will of God and Decisions. Uh, and the thesis was on, let's see here. I, I basically said that this paper is going to talk about how to view, I'm still working on it. I'm actually probably going to re, completely redo my paper <laughs> because I'm turning it into and I don't really like it the oh, way it is. Well, <laughs> and it's just, uh, it's. Comes with a warning label. <laughs> yeah. I just was like, I just, it never like came together. Like how oh. I, and I'm not even done with it anyways, but it's like eight and a half pages, so it just never came together how I thought what it would. What was your struggle? Why, why didn't it come together? It's, you dig into it and it's like a much bigger topic mm. than you even want to think about. Mm -hmm. And because like I found myself, I had to describe, I kind of go through like a background of like the time of America. We have all, we don't, we don't live in a caste system. We don't live in a medieval hierarchy. We have a plethora of choices. Mm. You know, our dad's not a blacksmith, so we're not a, you know, we're not a blacksmith, that type of thing. Versus now we're saved and so we were freed from this sin nature. And then there's different types of God's will. There's kind of like a soft, there's what different writers would call God's sovereign will, which might be something that's like a guaranteed, such as the rapture, mm -hmm. second coming. These are things that God will for sure come to pass. And then what I'm gonna call God's relational will, which different writers call different things. And so you have to kind of go through and describe these and you have to describe the traditional view and then you finally get into the alternative view or another view on it. And then from there on is where I think I'm gonna change it because I, I want it to be kind of like, here's a way you can think about it, maybe like a new process to think about it. But I ended up just, I just don't like, it's just, okay. <laughs> Audience is people that have struggled with decision making, specific, specifically the younger generation, uh, like a high school, college student, as they're arming and making lots of life decisions mm -hmm. and uh, people seem to have been, some people get into a paralysis of decision making, really afraid that their decision is not in the quote will of God. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a way for them to. Well, I know this, this topic is important to you, and so I'm here to help. So I'll go through, give my viewpoint, and if you want to continue on with it, send yeah. it back. Yeah, it's a disaster right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and my okay. tone. Well, again, I like, it comes yeah. with a warning label. Okay. <laughs> and All then right. my tone, I, I struggled big time with. Uh, it goes from like a we, I want it to be like a we, but I found a lot of times getting into a you, so I tried to like change it from the you to a we, and then it just got weird, so it's, uh, that's weird. Well, so. I'll take a look, <laughs> give you my advice, <laughs> Bailey. Um, my essay has a title and a subtitle and headings and subheadings. Okay. Um, my title is God in Control, Encouragement for the Out of Control Soul. And the subtitle is, Why God Being in Control Makes a Difference in Your Struggle with Anxiety. Mm -hmm. And um, my uh, headings are what it means to be in control, God is qualified to be in control, and I'll get to it. Um, and my subheadings kind of go through the different attributes of God and how it relates to him being in control and what that means for you. Um, and the last heading is God in control. 
Um, uh, let me see. My thesis is um, I seek to answer what God being in control means and how it makes a difference to you personally as a believer who struggles with anxiety. So it sounds um, like you're in process analysis. You're using you a lot. I, Are you in first person at all? First I'm using you? a lot of first person and a lot of we. A lot of we. Because I can. Okay. You're in first and second. It's a lot of um, a lot more first person than second person, though that is there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the audience is believers who struggle with anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, purpose to encourage and to point them to the Lord, mm -hmm. and to be thinking about the big God that is over there. Um, you know, little bubble that they get stuck in. Doesn't it help, Billy, to think about your audience when you're writing? Yes. It just does, one motivates one, doesn't it? Yeah. And it helps when you realize that you're a part of that audience. Correct, yep. So That's it makes I said. it, it helps relatable. When you, when you look at your audience and you see yourself a lot, in many ways, in that audience. And I felt with this essay, it was very, um, it was definitely something that I wanted to read myself. Mm -hmm. I wanted this resource sure. somewhere that I hadn't found yet, mm -hmm. so I wanted to write it because I needed it. <laughs> Very good. So. I, I, I even think about uh, what Cassandra sent us, and what was the title again? Uh, how to, so imagine where that could go. That, that could be used too, to help new people that are coming up there and ministering in that way. So it, again, it's that motivates you to want to write it when you realize your purpose and your audience. Mm -hmm. Mark? Um. I'll start with my brother's. He titled his essay, I am an evangelist, question mark. And his uh, thesis is, if you are a believer in Christ, you are an evangelist. His audience is Christians who have never before shared the gospel. And his purpose is to convince readers to evangelize and equip them to do so. His tone is teaching, but from the perspective of an upperclassman, not of a professor. And um, his design is an argument to convince and then switching to a process analysis uh -huh. in order to equip. That's very good. And that's what's great, too. We can change our organizational mode so we can use argument as our overarching grand design. And then within that, we can have the process. That's what he did. Um, I haven't finished my essay yet. I was going to write on God's intended purpose for our work and what he wants us to do with our income. I realized that was way too big of a topic and I had bit off more than I can chew. Now I want to, as of yesterday, I decided I want to narrow it down and do a compare and contrast between the characters in, on one side, the parable of the rich fool and on the other side, the, the parable of the hidden treasure and the parable of the pearl of great price, which they're one right after another in the book of Matthew and kind of the same idea between those, those other two parables. Mm, we um, have a comparison contrast in our midst. That's great. And you're probably in the third person. Yeah. And your tone probably is um, I haven't a figured that out yet. tone, I'm thinking, or narrative. <laughs> yeah. well, well, any questions you have, you can send it to me. You know. That. For brevity's sake, uh, I'll mention that uh, two weeks ago I mentioned what my thesis audience purpose and tone were. Uh, at this time, I'll tell you what my title is, mm -hmm. and it is Our Precious Position in Christ. Simply. Mm -hmm. That was worth doing it. Did we hear from anybody else? Well, there we are. Thank you for sharing that. And it's good for us to know what others are writing and working on. Uh, we talked about editing the last time we were here. And here's something from the Peanuts cartoon character. And uh, Snoopy's working. And he says, those years in Paris were to be among the finest of her life. Looking back, she once remarked, those years in Paris were among the finest of my life. That was what she said when she looked upon those years in Paris, where she spent some of the finest years of her life. Mm, I think this is going to need a little editing. <laughs> I think so. I'm glad you recognize that you're on your own. Uh, we talked about punctuation and mechanics the last time we were here. And writers, you have this big toolbox 
of punctuation marks to use. Unfortunately, many beginning writers only pull out a few. They'll pull out the period, they'll pull out the comma, and some will say, okay, there's 17 ways that I can use a comma, but the one way that I can't use it is connect two sentences together. That's one I'll do. No, you can't do that. Put it back. <laughs> Put it back. We have this semicolon we can pull out that joins two ideas, two complete sentences of balanced nature. We can use that. We can pull out a dash, which moves the idea forward in a bold way. We can pull out a colon, which also does the same thing more in a subtle way. We can use parentheses, which is even more subtle. We can use ellipse dots, which causes us to pause and to think or shows areas that we omitted in perhaps a piece of text. We have all these tools available to us. We have the asterisks. We have the brackets. But how many writers use the tools in their toolbox? They only use the standard hammer, screwdriver, drill, and that's it. So I hope as writers you've learned to use these, and if you have problems with wordiness in your writing, learn to love the colon, learn to love the dash, and learn to love the semicolon. And you probably noticed in your writing when I was editing, I added those in just to show you how you can get rid of all those words and move those ideas forward as you're using these tools in your toolbox. We also talked about proofreading and how important that is. Uh, proofread from a hard copy and don't listen to your content when you proofread. Some writers and some editors do this when they're proofreading. They start at the very end of their text and they read the last paragraph and then they move up because that way they can't hear the content. They're just zeroing in on the mechanics and also zeroing on if they left any words out or have any typos within there. So don't forget to proofread before you hand in that final paper. And here's my final lesson. This is lesson eight. It's not going to be a long one, but I hope it's an encouraging one. These are my closing thoughts to you as writers and as Gibbs students. Press on is my statement. Paul wrote, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Certainly our responsibility before the Lord is to be the best writers we can be and to keep growing in our writing, to press on and to trust the Lord with our work. We only know what we are doing now, but God knows what we are doing in light of eternity. Please trust your work with him. Colossians 1, 10 through 12 are some of my favorite verses, and I gave it the title, The Worthy Walk that you might walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. When I read this text, I say, look at all the participles. Look at all the participles. Remember, the Greek language is a participle loving language. We are to be pleasing, to being, increasing, strengthened, giving. Learn to walk with the Lord in your writing and in your ministry. Let God teach you and bless your work. And also let the voices of Christian writers from the past encourage us. So I pulled together some of the writers from the past and one from the present that I'd like to share with you. And here's one from Charles Spurgeon. He writes, visit many good books but live in the Bible. I like that. Because I've encouraged you as writers to study for the craft, and we're out there reading a lot of good books and a lot of great articles. But go back to the Word of God, and that's where we live. And also, when you're reading, notice the beauty of the language that you see in the Word of God. Charles Spurgeon also gave us this advice as writers. He says, if you write... Boil two sentences into one and three words into two. Always when practical, avoid lengthiness. Learn to be short. So what Charles Spurgeon is teaching us is get rid of the clutter in your writing. He also would probably say shorter is usually better than longer because we tend to remember things that are shorter rather than lengthy uh, pieces of sentences and paragraphs. 
I wanted you to see this piece. This is uh, Spurgeon's own work where he was writing, and as you know, he was a voluminous writer. He wrote many books and essays and such. And here is an example of him editing his own work. So he went back, and of course, he didn't have the benefit of a computer as we do today. And he had to handwrite and hand edit all his work. So I'm thinking, if Charles Spurgeon was this uh, particular, if you will, and precise about his own writing, that shows me that I can do the same and I should do the same. So this encouraged me when I found it. He also wrote, Scripture is the writing of the living God. Each letter was penned with an almighty finger. What a privilege we have as Gibbs students, and I as your Gibbs instructor, to get into the Word of God and to study it and to teach it and to appreciate it. And when we were in our grammatical studies, that's what we were doing. We were looking at the sentences. We were looking at the verses. We were seeing how they work together. We were seeing the various elements. We were able to diagram them. We were finding the main ideas, the sub-ideas, the main clauses, the subordinate clauses, and it allows us to even see that Word of God more clearly and effectively, and what a privilege it was for us to study the Word of God. He also wrote this. He says, we are too prone to engrave our trials in marble and write our blessings in sand. How true. He was a master with words, wasn't he? And he was a master at creating analogies and pictures in our minds. He used concretions. Charles Henry Mackintosh, who has written and compiled the Mackintosh Treasury, and if you don't have one of those books and texts in your library, you probably will want to get one. He says, the man who will present Christ to others must be occupied with Christ for himself or for herself as well. And that is so true in our ministry, that it begins with our relationship with Jesus Christ, which then, in turn, affects others. But if we're starting in the opposite way, starting first of all with working the work and then thinking that we're going to present Christ to others, I think we're writing and thinking amiss on this one. So that was a good reminder to me when I found that quote. Dr. J. Vernon McGee wrote, the Lord puts us into the storms of life in order that we might grow closer to him. I remember when um, Pastor Leonard Radke first asked me to speak. I think it was at a youth retreat or something like that. And um, my first reaction was, I said to him, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do that. He said to me, Carol, if I didn't think that you could do that, do you think I would ask you? He said, I know you can't do that, but the Lord can. So trust him in your work. Another thing he said to me is, I also must warn you, that when you are in a teaching situation, writing or speaking, the Lord puts you quite often through the trials first so that you experience them and put, them, put the application in you so then you can work with others. And that's why I brought this verse to your attention because the Lord puts us into the storms of life in order that we might draw closer to him. And then in turn, when we draw closer to him, then we can affect others as well. So don't look at the trials that you have going on in your life as something that is overbearing. Look at them in many ways as a blessing and a gift from God and find joy in that as well. D.L. Moody said, some people think God does not like to be troubled with their constant coming and asking. The way to trouble God is not to come at all. One of my first quotes that I gave you was from Martin Luther. And remember how I said it? Prayer is the better half of study. Don't forget that. In fact, it's good to have that in front of your computer, because the tendency is just to dive right in and start that study and not spend time with the Lord in prayer over it. Charles Ryrie had this quote, the Bible is the greatest of all books. To study it is the noblest of all pursuits. To understand it, the highest of all goals. He was a master with words as well. I love reading his work. And if you will, notice even how he put those ideas together with a semicolon. The Bible is the greatest of all books, first statement. But he didn't want a period there. He wanted to join the idea together. So he says, to study, it is the noblest 
of all pursuits, to understand it, the highest of all goals. Three important ideas brought together by the semicolon and comes as one unit. Warren Wiersbe, his comment about ministry is this, ministry happens when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. And I want to end with the Apostle Paul's words to you from Colossians 4, 5 through 6. This is my prayer for you as well, if students. Walk in wisdom toward those who are without, <coughs> redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Let your speech and let your writing be always with grace. We are what we are by the grace of God. As writers, as grammarians, as students, as believers in Christ. So that's why I titled this lesson tonight, Lessons in Simplicity and Grace, because grace has been extended to us at the cross and extended to us every day. And it's been such a wonderful opportunity and privilege for me to teach you students throughout the year. I know these courses are not easy. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of prayer, a lot of energy. But um, I'm grateful to have been your instructor. And I will continue to pray for you. All my gift students are in my prayer journal, and that's where you're going to stay. So keep on pressing on, as the Apostle Paul says. And I look forward to reading your work. So have a good time.